only have Sally James from the Governors and we are expecting Janet Knowles and Cecilia Gould um, to join us. But I don't think they will mind if we deal with some of the early housekeeping um, uh, issues. So good morning, everybody. Uh, we have apologies today from Eileen and we should have Claire Winch with us a bit later uh, in order to deputise and also from Megana uh, and with Andrew Brent with her, us deputising for Megana uh, and also Joy is unable to make it today uh, on the non-exec side. Laura, I think those are all the apologies, is that right? That's correct. And we do have both Claire and Andrew with you in the meeting. Excellent. Thanks. Welcome, welcome Claire. Um, I'm sure everyone will have been reminded by a little thing popping up on their screen that this meeting is being recorded uh, and will be available through the Ottawa Hospitals Trust YouTube channel um, uh, after the meeting. Um, may I just check whether there are any um, declarations of interests that need to be um, formally declared in the minutes in relation to any of today's business. Uh, Anne first and then Ash. Anne. Um, me, it's just uh, as a trustee of Oxford Hospitals Charity because I'm pretty certain that comes up in one or two places in the papers. Thank you. Ash? It's not directly related to the papers but I am now a non-executive director at uh, NHS Sussex ICB. Thanks, Ash, and congratulations uh, on that. Um, we look forward to insights into the workings of ICBs that, that come from that uh, uh, new role for you. Um, thank you. Um, in that case, perhaps I can then turn to the minutes of the meeting that we held uh, in January. I'm not alerted to any required um, corrections but that doesn't mean there aren't any. So may I just check whether there are any corrections to those minutes? Uh, Claire. Um, I'm sorry to be a bit of a broken record on this, but number 12, freedom to speak up. I'm still sort of not clear where we're going to hear about the resourcing issue because it was going to be at the board. I think it's now at the IAC, but I just wanted to make sure we'd sort of captured it. Um, so I did speak briefly with Eileen about this just before she um, uh, went off uh, and um, she tells me that things are chugging their way through and various colleagues supported but it hasn't quite come together yet in terms of how that resourcing is going to operate. Um, Jason, thank you for coming to my rescue on that because you were one of the people she said was being very helpful. Uh, so there's a paper going to our business planning group tomorrow, which is the first stage of governance. It will then go through TME and the board committee. Um, uh, so it, 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 Eileen and Claire have produced have produced a paper um, and we can probably give you regular updates on its progress through governance, um, although it may well have completed that progress by the IAC in April. Jason, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't lost. So I think there's probably an action there to come back to the May board by which time it should have been through those processes and that will track it through. Claire are you happy with that? I see you've put your hand up too. Yeah I was just going to say the same thing as Jason but um, it, it, we should be able to update IAC and board. So let's note um, let's notice as a matter arising that the um, the the resourcing aspect of the report on Freedom to Speak Up is due to be taken at the May board, having been through IAC uh, with the usual preparations um, through that, and that will enable us to track it, Claire. Thank you. Um, there was, I think, uh, a matter arising that we should probably track through here in relation to the vaccination as a condition of deployment, um, given what's happened since the last meeting. And Terry, I wondered if you wanted to um, just put into the minutes a, a, a note of where we are in relation to that. Um, so as you may know, um, the government put out a consultation to um, revoke um, vaccination as a condition of, of deployment. Um, they've uh, now withdrawn um, vaccination of a, as a condition of deployment from March the 15th, I believe it is. Um, so uh, we're no longer progressing with that. Thanks, Terry. And I think it's fair to say from the 
chat in the staff briefing where you reported on that last time that, that there is a significant issue for us to keep an eye on in terms of the impact on culture and morale. There are strong views on both sides, um, so I think it's something that we would want you to keep us appraised of as necessary, Terry, because I think while the formal thing has gone away, that's not the end of the work that you and your team will be um, dealing with around healing some of the wounds that were there. And uh, you had the difficult challenge of, sort of relaying the board's position on that um, uh, to the uh, all staff briefing. And thank you for doing that. It, it's worth noting, Jonathan, if I may, that the execs have all agreed to do some listening events. And we're doing listen events with our staff to hear where they are and, and, and to sign posts accordingly. Thank you. I'm grateful for that because it it clearly is a significant concern for quite a number of our, uh, our staff. Um, Jason, you still have a hand up at all? Was that oh, the old thing? hand, sorry, Chair. Okay, that's fine. I think those were the matters arising. So if colleagues are comfortable with that, we should move on to the, uh, the action log and just review um, uh, the actions. Um, the uh, there's a few that relate to um, maternity, and we have a substantial uh, item on maternity later with a, a, a number of papers. Um, I, as uh, I'm sure um, Sam is reminded uh, frequently, you know, are uh, very keen that we get an overview of the maternity issues, and I'm concerned that as things come through dealing with the the various things that we have to do uh, in terms of reports, it, it doesn't always help us get a, a clear sight uh, on that. And I know Sam is going to address that when we get to those items um, with a presentation, but I think, Sam, it means that the, the open items we have around maternity services in terms of the uh, better understanding about who gets which experience in terms of uh, locality, uh, etc., and the overarching template. Uh, they stay open at this stage because you're still working on that with colleagues. Is, is, is that the right way of putting it, Sam? I think so, Chairman. The, the first one, I have inserted a slide. I haven't seen that circulated yet, but I plan to do a short slide presentation um, when it comes to the maternity items to summarise. So I think the first action probably close. The second action is for discussion as part of the presentation, um, so I can update on progress with, and timescales. Thank you. So let's just check that when we've done that item on the agenda and then we can check um, if someone reminds me whether we need to close that. Um, the uh, emergency department complaints issue, um, we took an update to IAC in February, so I think that board item can be closed in relation to um, the board action. Um, Sam, are you happy with that proposal? Thank you. Um, and then we get the uh, integrated performance report update on clinical standards in urgent care. But my brief is that we can't update because that no one's told us them yet. Is that still the case, Sam? You're on mute, Sam. Sarah. It's Sarah's action. Sorry, Sarah. I'm sorry. I'm just misreading the line. Sarah. You're on mute, Sarah. So the, on the urgent care standards. Yes. 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 So um, I, uh, they they haven't published the urgent care standards, but they have published changes in the contract. So we're just working that through as part of the annual plan. So we'll, I'll bring something to the next meeting if I may, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. So we should keep that open um, for now yeah. and and close it once we've got that detailed um, analysis. Uh, and then in relation to uh, the final item that's that's open. Um, we have the quality improvement um, report on the agenda for the April IAC. So I think, Sam, you think that's OK from the board action. Is that right? That will be, but I just think it needs further definition um, because it's specifically related to um, pressure damage falls and nutrition. So I think that needs to be um, in there as the part of the action, Neil, just so that there's no confusion about the overarching uh, quality improvement that Sarah will be bringing. OK, will you work with Neil just to get that wording right, Sam, and, and also, I guess, Sarah on that so that we we know that what we've closed and we know that what stays open. OK, I think that was everything from the action um, log and matters arising. Has anybody got anything to 
add to those. OK, thank you very much. If I could move on to a um, uh, small number of things under um, chair's business, um, then. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank in her absence, Joy, for um, talking to the Women's Network yesterday for International um, Women's Day uh, on her career experiences. I'm pretty sure that happened. I, I stayed for the first half of the meeting and then had to go to the listening event that um, uh, we were holding in relation to chief executive recruitment. So she hadn't actually arrived at the point when I did it. And the previous speaker, um, Annalise Dodds, had had to pull out due to parliamentary business. Um, so uh, uh, it was interesting to, to join them. And um, uh, I hope that they got uh, a useful experience from, from Joy. Uh, and that gets on the record the fact that um, although Magna's on leave, she was also able to give a message for International Women's Day and uh, a number of people, including uh, Katie, participated in the uh, video messages that, that went round. Um, I certainly found it very interesting just to sit and um, listen to uh, the discussions. And there are quite a lot of challenges coming up from that network, as from all our networks. Uh, and I think perhaps as a board, we might want to think about how we receive some feedback um, from the networks. So the executives around the board table are all connected um, with networks and we haven't quite worked out how to feed that in, I think, to our, our board discussion. So I think I, having sat in on that, I think it would be useful for us to find a way of, of putting that into our understanding. So uh, just to note that I'll have a bit of a chat um, uh, with Neil about how we might get that on the, the agenda. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, and if you see in the chat, that Joy was inspirational. Jason has it on good authority. Um, the second thing on the agenda is just to uh, remind everybody that we have some new governors who've been elected. I'm pleased to say we have some continuing governors um, as well. Um, but the biggest change that we'll see as a board uh, is that Cecilia Gould uh, had chosen not to stand uh, for re-election. Uh, and we therefore are just starting an election process for a new lead governor um, to replace Cecilia. Um, Cecilia, I can see, is now here. So, uh, Cecilia, thank you very much for uh, all the work that you've put into the Trust over many years. Um, it's been very enjoyable um, working with you. Not 100% enjoyment, because, of course, that's the role of the governors to make sure that we um, keep on our toes and focus, but immensely constructive. And I suspect sometimes personally quite costly to uh, you as the governor. It's not an easy role and we're very grateful um, to you, Cecilia. So thank you. You've come off mute. Do you want to say something, Cecilia? I just want to say it's been a tremendous honour to work with you guys in the Trust and I wish you all the best. And you may the relationship between the board and the council of governors has matured and um i wish you well and uh, as i say it's been very interesting <laughs> thank you so much and all the best and to bruno particularly thank you so much for all the work you've done and um your 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 leadership has been very very appreciated thank you that's the end of me <laughs> Thank you, Cecilia, Thank you. and just uh, it was a real joy working with you. So thanks for all of the contributions to the trust as well. We know where you are, Cecilia. We know you're not very far away, so we uh, we hope to keep in touch. So thank you. Indeed. Um, uh, seeing as we're not talking about Bruno, um, the uh, just an update on where we are in terms of the recruitment process. Um, we have now appointed Odgers Bernston to lead the recruitment process for us. <clears throat> we have a uh, an indicative timetable which is aiming to have panel interviews in May. Um, I think that is challenging but um, attainable, and we'll uh, aim to keep to that. We're about to go more publicly out for um, a search and we're in the process of refining um, the person specification uh, and the job description and what it is that we're after and we're doing that refinement in conjunction with a number of conversations uh, including with people around this table but um, currently most importantly we have had the first of four 
staff listening events just to enable staff to feedback on the uh, things that they think we should be looking for. And there's a little trickle of emails beginning to come in in, in terms of uh, suggestions uh, on that. We're saying broadly to staff that um, we're trying to be as open and broad in terms of listening at this stage, but, um, but then it will need to become necessarily more careful and confidential um, as uh, it, we make contact with individual names. Um, the uh, process is sort of owned by the non-executives who need to make that appointment and needs the approval of the Council of Governors um, when we get to, to that phase. Um, I think key messages that have come out of the uh, listening events uh, of those so far you know, are around the fact that we're committed to a set of values that we've established and we're not looking to change those. So we're looking for a new leader who shares the values that we have uh, at present, that we're looking for uh, a leader who is collaborative and empowers colleagues um, to work. Um, quite a strong sense from frontline staff of wanting to feel closely connected um, uh, and get a sense of uh, the new leaders. Um, and some key issues around um, focus on the people in the trust who deliver um, the services, the patients for whom we deliver it, and capitalising on the opportunities that Oxford has in the collaborations with the universities on research uh, and education. And that's been my sort of opening summary of what I'm hearing at the listening events. Uh, and I think what we heard yesterday gave various glosses on that, but it was broadly consistent um, uh, with that. So we will continue to listen to those things coming in and then we will try and craft that in the next couple of weeks or so into a, a statement in a person spec that you know will form the public basis of, a, of our search. Any suggestions on how to do this are gratefully received confidentially but I don't think for this this meeting. Um, uh, Bruno I think it's fair to say that this is the first item I feel I've been losing sleep over since I've been at the trust because it's uh, you know it's the one thing I can't pass to you to deal with um, and uh, you know it's a hard act to follow um, but we'll do our best to recruit someone who can do that and the board I think you know, needs to be assured that we are going through an appropriate robust process and uh, perhaps I'll invite people to pick that up outside the meeting if there's anything else they want to add in they haven't already um, done so. So our aim is to know who Bruno's successor is by the time that he steps down. Um, uh, and uh, we should also note that we've begun thinking about how to handle any possible uh, interregnum that might be there. And some preliminary discussions have been had um, and I'll have those more privately with colleagues um, uh, and with the non-execs in terms of signing off. So I think that's the, those are the things I can say in public about the recruitment process. Um, I don't know whether those who were at the listening event yesterday or also had conversations wanted to add or clarify anything to that. Can I just check whether they do? Claire. I think what really struck me was how um, glad people were to be asked actually and how important it was for them to be able to express their views about the requirements so it's a very positive process I think of listening to to staff on that subject. Thanks Claire. I also got that impression I've also tried very hard to say that this is not the same as saying they get what they say they want you know that this is part of a process that we have to get right and it's our job to get it right um thank you um and then i think the final thing just to report on, under my business is that um there have been interviews for the icb non-executive the integrated care board non-executive positions um i understand that javed khan the chair has decided the appointments he wants to make, but I don't think they're yet public. Um, so we should shortly know who the non-executive directors are. Um, I was part of the interview panel for one of the two days of interviews, uh, and I think they were an impressive group of people. So I'm confident that from that list, you know, we will see some interesting, uh, refreshing ideas coming into our um, Bob ICS system. Uh, and as soon as we've seen those published, um, we'll circulate them around for information. Um, that was all the business that I had um, and I'll therefore pass on to Bruno for the Chief Executive's report. Bruno. 
Yeah, Jonathan, and I mean, it's an extensive report. Um, most of it will be known to board members. So rather than repeating what people already have read and possibly know before even reading the report, I'll just uh, be happy to answer any questions if people have any further um, uh, questions on the report. In terms of the current uh, COVID uh, situation, it's uh, it's about the same as when we last met uh, uh, last uh, week. Um, so uh, COVID is still still around, um, and therefore, in contrast to what we all can do in our uh, private lives, uh, the IPC measures are still the same in uh, in our um, hospital locations. Thank you, Bruno. Are there any questions or comments for Bruno on the items in his report? Thank you. Um, it shows everyone's read it, which is good. And that tells us to move on to uh, our um, patient story, um, which is more like a story than sometimes it is, um, and uh, deals with an area where we have discussed a number of times the pressures that are on the trust in terms of being able to keep flow going through. And Sam, I'll uh, hand over to you. Thank you, Chairman. I'm, I'm hoping that in the background, Neil or Laura are getting ready to, to press play on a short video. But just as a, a bit of background, because the video will speak for itself. Um, so it's a simple story, but it's an important story. Um, our reflections are that this is about respecting patients' time. <laughs> And it's also about not wasting um, clinicians' time by reworking um, when we haven't planned discharge uh, as well as could do. Um, it's really important. We're obviously focusing on the, the long length of stay over 21 days, but there's also huge opportunity with patients that have shorter length of stay. And just interestingly, for and I, we were contacted over the weekend about a, a great patient experience through the urgent care pathway over a couple of days and then recontacted when a very simple medication issue um, affected the experience of the individual. So simple message um, with, with thanks. I've got quite a lot of background noise coming through. Sorry, it's not me. Um, but just with, with thanks, I think it's really powerful that one of our emergency department consultants developed this short video. Um, once we've shared this, then we'll, we'll share with colleagues. So they're stories based on real patient experiences and complaints that we've answered. Um, but obviously, uh, Adam's put a, a twist and created some characters on this. So um, I'll leave it to Neil to play the, play the video. I'd like to tell you three quick stories about patients who each received good care in hospital, but were let down by the administration of their discharge. Frances is 85 years old and was checked out at the hospital after having some chest pain. Thankfully, it wasn't anything serious and so she was discharged home. She couldn't make her own way home and so a taxi on the hospital account was organised for her. When she got home and the taxi had driven off, it was only then that she realised that she didn't have her front door key or her mobile phone. What's more, her friends and family were also unaware that she was being sent home and there was nobody around to help let her in. After wandering down the street, an ambulance was called by a concerned neighbour and she had to be brought back to the hospital. Irene is 90 years old and lives in a lovely residential home specialising in dementia care that's just around the corner from her family. Irene had to come to the hospital after a head injury. In the emergency department, she received a prompt assessment and care that included a CT scan, wound closure and a medication review. She was returned back to her care home within four hours when she got home, Irene was unable to recall what had happened at the hospital. The care home workers saw she had some staples in her head wound, but didn't know when or how to take them out. They weren't sure if she was supposed to continue her blood thinners or not, and they no longer had a copy of Iris's DNA CPR purple form that they had sent to hospital with her. This required several phone calls to the hospital, the emergency department and GP to sort out, and ultimately required the use of a courier to return documents and a staple remover to the care home. This is Terry. Terry is fiercely independent and doesn't consider his age a barrier to living life and looking after himself. And he came to the ED after cutting his foot while gardening. Terry came to the emergency department at eight o'clock in the evening. And at that time, there was a three hour wait to be seen. He was seen around 11 o'clock in the evening 
and after an x-ray and some wound care, he was discharged home with some antibiotics. He told the staff he would make his own way home, but was never asked how. In fact, he had decided that he could walk the three miles home from the hospital, even though it was nearly 1am by the time he had left the department. He was picked up by a passing police car two miles from the hospital and taken the rest of the way home, when he realised that he'd left before being given his prescription. Although these three cases are fictional, they all contain aspects of real stories. As healthcare professionals, we must consider a few extra elements after patients have completed their medical care to ensure the post-discharge organisation is as good as that when we are by the bedside. All patients, especially those who are particularly young, elderly, vulnerable, or returning to another care setting, must be fit for discharge. Remember Francis. Think front door key and friends and family. How are they getting in and are they aware? Remember Irene. What information do patients need to return with? Written is always best and doesn't rely on memory recall. Discharge summaries, patient information leaflets, and DNA CPR forms. Remember Terry. Consider TTOs, transport, and time of day. Temperature is also a problem, as patients in the emergency department don't always leave with the clothes they came in, or the right ones for the time of year. The patient's own bed is often the best one for them, but in our desire to get them home as soon as possible, we need to remember that it's often the details that make the difference. My name is Adam Karlik, and I'm an A&E consultant in Oxford. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you found it helpful. Thanks very much, Connie. Great. So I think all initiatives from the Trust and Future have to be fit tested in some way, don't they? So uh, everything has to fit into a, a fit acronym. Um, thanks very much. Would you pass on thanks to Adam for um, uh, producing that um, for us? And it is somehow more powerful, isn't it, when you see the story unfolding in front of you um, than when you just read it all as a, as a lump. Um, Sam, are there any things from that story that you would like us as a board to um, sort of put on our agenda and in our thoughts? So I think this is part of our quality improvement programme. We want to improve patients' experience around um, discharge. So I think this is a great um, tool that Adam has produced for us and uh, the executives will work with our um, clinical operational colleagues to you know, to sort of launch this today, I, I guess. Um, it, it is very real. It's just interesting that Sarah and I have dealt with some concerns just over the weekend. I think for me, it is about respecting patients' time um, and impacting on their experience, as well as reducing sort of wasted time um, from clinicians and colleagues across the system. So really grateful to Adam, um, and we'll ensure that this is widely communicated um, across the system um, and will reduce incidences of like uh, like this through complaints monitoring and incident reporting. Sam, does the the FIT acronym, do you see that as aimed at our staff so that it's a sort of cross check for them or can we use it also to empower families and patients to say that you, know, you should feel happy to ask about these things because um, if you you're not sure they've been thought about that this is a prompt for your your checking before someone's suggesting. Can we use it like that as well? I think I think you're right. And I think, you know, a, a bottom up acronym is a really powerful acronym. It's not something national that we've been told to do. So I'm sure that Adam will be really key in implementing this across the assessment areas. Um, one of the other themes that comes through with complaints that we've really need to work on, although there's um, new visiting guidance that's come out overnight that we'll be reviewing over the next couple of days, is um, part of that video where we don't um, have good communication with friends and family. And we often talk through that patients have got capacity um, and there's an expectation that they will communicate with their friends and family. So it, it certainly is an area for us to improve on. Um, and as you say, it's something that we can work with with friends and family of our patients to um, just support us to make sure that those checks and um, actions are in place so that we don't fail a discharge. Thanks, Sam. I have Tony and then Anne, Paula and Sarah. So Tony first. Thanks, Jonathan. I, I thought this was excellent and it's such an important and simple message um, for, for staff and, and as you say, for patients where appropriate and family and 
I, I agree with Sam that it should be uh, run through our whole system, but I was thinking more nationally, actually. This is a really important issue uh, throughout the NHS, and is there an opportunity to um, provide this uh, more widely across the NHS? I'll just move on, Sam, because I think you could. Yeah, well, Sarah, up with the and I will share it. Well, Sarah and I will share that with Ekist, and um, I thought we'd probably tweet it out today after board um, and uh, share with colleagues across. That's why Adams removed the OUH um, branding so that it can just be used and shared. Thank you, Anne. Okay, well, I just want to say it was really good and, and amazing. I just thought it was a wonderful um, thing to do. Um, I, my my suggestion was, you know, could we adopt that kind of approach for a lot of other messages that we wish to do, to wish to make, because it's just so powerful. And I, I'm sure, I mean, I'm not speaking on behalf of the charity, but I'm sure it's something that the charity would be very willing to help us um, produce in terms of whatever we need to do that. So I just think it's something we can adopt more widely for important messages that we want to um, share. Thanks. Paula? Thank you. It's hard not to be in the queue to compliment this, actually. Um, I thought it was brilliant. Um, and Tony sort of made my point for me. Um, I'm sure all of us who've um, had responsibility for elderly people in and out of different hospitals um, would value the focus on these simple things. Um, I thought it was absolutely on message. Um, Sam's point about communicating with friends and family really really important but then the national um rollout uh, the, the, the application more widely to get people to benefit i just thought was a wonderful idea so huge compliments thank you paula uh, sarah yeah so i share the general enthusiasm i thought it was a fantastic video but i think jonathan picking up the point you made about can we actually empower patients through this as well to actually you know that as a checklist because they're all things that you know I don't think it's about capability necessarily, but we're in an you're in an A and E environment. You don't think about have I got my phone, have I got my keys, what's going on? You're completely focused on something different. So, just having this up around the department to to help patients ask the right questions and to raise when they haven't got things. I think you know let let's all work together on this and making those discharges work. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Chair. And you know, I think this is these sorts of tools are really helpful, aren't they, for um, helping patients and probably also families to check things before they or relative are discharged. But but I'm struck by the fact that a lot of the things that these sort of generic stories highlight that we don't get right are things that when they're not under pressure, all our staff know about. So I'm interested in there's nothing you know, there's not, some of these things may be sort of new to a relative who hasn't thought about it from this perspective, but they won't be remotely new to any of our staff who work on the complex medical units, as it were. And I just wonder, I mean, Sam, if you've got any perspective on what are the factors that mean that our staff sometimes don't get this right? I mean, it'd be great if, say, more patients and relatives prompted at, asked questions to, to prompt and remind, but actually this is all also fairly obvious and I know if they weren't under pressure our staff know that so do you have any thoughts about what we can do to get these obvious things right? I mean I think um, I'd welcome Andrew I think I think it's great to have a multi-professional approach I think it's really strong that Adam has produced this um, I think he might be seconded to the comms team with Terry but um, um, I think it's about systematic checklists that's how we tend to get our compliance up um, and I think that there are multiple handoffs um, and handovers. We overcomplicate some of our simple discharges and, and they run over a number of shifts and there's assumptions made that um, people are ready to go um, when actually there's still um, some simple loose ends to tie up that have an impact if they're not delivered. So we'll, Sarah and I offline um, with colleagues from medical teams will just work through how we operationalise this and I suspect it will be something along the lines of a of a checklist, and that may well be something that David can help us with as well. Thanks, Sam. And I'm seeing a hand, but I think it's an old one. Is that right? I think it is. Um, 
there's something here, I think, which is a, a challenge for us quite often in, in, in the trust is that the the things that should be common sense and straightforward get squeezed out by the stuff that are really hard and everybody need knows that they have to focus on to get right because if they don't focus on it it, it won't work smoothly um so i think the the sort of checklist way of making sure that people don't forget those things is is very important i i do think the discussions we've had about sort of chairing that that checklist is around so that actually we empower patients to ask have you done this families to ask has has this been done uh, you know, is a way of making it a shared process and that's a key isn't it to these things running running smoothly it's, it's not well I have a friend who used to remind me that um uh, rocket science is all about doing little things right you know, so when we say it's not rocket science actually this is just like rocket science is that every little bit of the step has to be the right one and then the whole thing comes uh, uh, comes together whereas if you neglect some easy straightforward things then you undermine all the brilliant work um, that you've done separately and uh, Adam's animation nicely brought that that home didn't it so Sam thank you very much for um, bringing that to us and please pass on the universal adulation that's there for uh, this and the the very long list of similar animations that will now be required on the back of the uh, uh, the success that's there um, that's been really helpful May I then move us on to the integrated um, performance um, report? Uh, and as usual, we've not invited colleagues to present it. We'll throw it open for um, people to ask questions. But of course, that doesn't stop colleagues who particularly would like to um, make observations about areas doing so. So who would like to go first on questions on the integrated performance report? Katie. Uh, no questions per, per, as such, just a couple of um, remarks. So um, I'm very pleased to see actually in the in the private session later on, we're going to see the business case associated with the increase in staff in, in infection control, because it's a little alarming when you see the numbers um, around um, infection that are not quite where we want them to be. So very good that there's a business case to consider later. Um, I'm also delighted to see the fact that there is um, um, some thought being given to the robotic uh, pharmacy um, solution. Um, and I actually pinged David and Ash about that last week because I saw a report on it and I wondered whether we were going to be doing it. So it's nice to see that it's 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 uh, noted in the papers. And then finally, um, on the EDI um, piece, um, you'll know that I'm on that committee. Um, and so we did indeed um, have a look at the uh, objectives um, around uh, what needs to happen in EDI to make sure that we're we're being more inclusive and so on. Um, and there's a lot to do with data and technology in that, actually, because we need to make sure that we understand the underlying data trends to be able to make a difference. So, so just some observations, um, uh, things that are resonating through our, our committees uh, and discussions that are that are evident in the pack. Thanks. Thank you, Katie. Sarah? Sarah Horton, that is. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so I've got a a few um, from different areas of the pack, so I don't know if we want to just do them one at a time. Um, there's first one was, in areas, Sarah, so if, if there's a yeah. cluster, you can do that, but do them in areas. OK, so I think th actually there is a cluster. The first one's around page nine on the IPR um, around the discharges, and there's a, a reference to Operation Reset. I think given, um, and this is to do with the length of stay over 21 days, it would be interesting just to hear from Sarah a little bit about what that is and how much impact it's having on the on the length of stay. Um, and then the next two, which given Megan's not around, but there's uh, the infection prevention control that Katie's picked up. There's also comments, and I've, I've heard it elsewhere, around the Churchill cleaning um, and understanding whether we're making progress on that, because that's clearly an issue of concern to the team. Um, and linked into that is the C diff, um, whether there's an action plan about those rising C diff rates as well. And then there's a finance one to follow, but if I do those, those are the sort of clinical quality ones. Thank you. Who wants to start on those? Um, no one's volunteering. 
don't think it's very fair to throw Andrew into the uh, mix immediately. So, uh, Sam, if you can go first and then Sarah Randall, and then I'll see whether Andrew's got anything to add. If I if I pick up Churchill cleaning, then I'm sure Sarah's going to pick up the reset piece. Um, so I'm really glad you raised that, Sarah, because yesterday we had a corporate um, performance review where we explored uh, PFI and where we are in a position um, following the, the board's decision to take the options appraisal to um, increase the kind of clinical synergy and oversight. So under Andrew Carter's leadership, we presented to divisional directors and exec colleagues yesterday, both the complexities of our three PFIs, uh, the contract um, requirements, um, but more importantly, the performance management and accountability framework that Andrew's been developing um, with the teams so that we can get the clear line of sight over a range of um, patient experience um, and patient safety um, indicators. So I think that went very well. Um, and what we do have confidence in now is that we have um, a clinical lead working very closely with the Churchill PFI team on an improvement program. This is something that we would react to on a day to day basis rather than, say, an estates piece that might take a little while and need prioritisation. I'm assured that uh, this is something that the PFI team are working with the trust team on a daily basis. There's a rectification plan um, and we're monitoring that and we're expecting to receive an update through Clinical Governance Committee next Wednesday. Thanks, Sam. Sarah? Thank you. So Operation um, Reset was looking in particular at discharges of patients. It was also a national ask at that time for January. So we worked with our improvement um, team and the clinical divisions to look at and focused on a number of wards, not a lot of wards because it was for a short period of time. So the output of that and we had real, real great engagement. So we looked primarily at MRC and some wards at the, the Horton. So both the JR and, 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 and the Horton. So we saw a reduction in the medically optimised fit for discharge. Um, and um, for over that course of that week. So what we are looking at doing is taking that forward as part of our quality improvement program and getting it right first time for patients. And we've talked about that obviously partly in the previous conversation around FIT, but um, but actually working that through now. So we're, the urgent care group who are actually meeting today are agreeing what the metrics are and how we're going to focus on and looking at that. And also looking at standardising and really, really reviewing our patients that are stranded, people have been with us a long time so as well, so in addition. So looking at rolling out right across the organisation. So you'll see that come through, Sarah, in our quality improvement programme. Fantastic. And will we set some targets in that around where we'd like to get to so we've got something to track against? Absolutely. Um, and then we'll see that through and that'll be tracked um, weekly and not daily, weekly and monthly. Yeah. Thanks, Sarahs. Um, just want to check, Andrew, did you want to add anything on the infection control? And then I'll go back to Sarah for the finance question. Please, may I thank you. So um, I'm Andrew Brent. I'm one of the deputy CMOs covering for Megan today. I'm an infectious diseases physician by background. I'm grateful, Sarah, to your question and Katie for you raising the, the point about the infection control business case. Um, the, the, clearly, the increase in, in cases is, is, is not quite where we want to be. I think it's in, in CDIF in particular. I think it's important to recognise that the the, the, the limits that were set for us were set in a pre-COVID area and clearly COVID's had a big impact on presenting caseloads with inf respiratory infections who have antibiotics. Antibiotics is the single most important driver of C. diff um, and a key part of that business case, so to answer your question, Sarah, about what the action is, a key part of that business case is for resource to be able to do more routine antimicrobial stewardship rounds in order to um, make sure that antibiotic tr treatment is as rationalised as possible and stopped where appropriate. And you'll have seen in that slide that there is an example of a pilot that was done at the Horton that showed a 58% um, uh, 58% prescriptions were changed as a result of a pilot um, antimicrobial stewardship round there at the Horton, including the majority in the majority of cases with the ability to stop the antibiotics. So I know you'll get the chance to scrutinise uh, that business case later. Thank you for the question. Thanks so much, Andrew and Sarah. Back to you for the finance question. Thank you, Jonathan. So um, I, I know that 
uh, Jason's team are working on the finance section and it's an evolving piece and I think it, it is it is getting easier to see the story um, each month that goes by so thank you Jason and can you thank the team. Um, there was just one on page 105 um, there's a slight throwaway line around the non-pay underlying budget pressures of 19 million it's the sort of biggest variance that doesn't really get any narrative against it um, and I just wondered a, if you can give us any insight into what that is, um, and B, whether you're comfortable that that's covered in the reforecast as we close in on month, on year end. Thank you, Sarah. And um, Jonathan, am I off mute now? Yes. Um, so thank you, Sarah. And so I've been working quite in quite a lot of depth with my team on this. It is largely an artifact of where we put some of the cost pressures or risks which we couldn't attribute to different budget lines during the process of closing out the plan. Um, and um, it's very hard to pull it down to specific assumptions which turned out to be wrong. Um, effectively, we, we, we had a strong hypothesis we were going to get a load of extra income and we saw that there was a certain amount of risk that we put into the non-pay line. And as you can see from sort of the overall forecast position, that was we were broadly right on the on the amount of extra income, but it doesn't have uh, a clear sort of recurrent pressure challenge going into next year. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Are you done now, Sarah? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Claire, you're next in the queue and it'll be Tony after Claire. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, it's also a question about finance. So I agree with Sarah that things are getting clearer and thank you for that, Jason. I think when I look at the executive summary, particularly as a non-financial person, I'm trying to get a sense of what the major issues are in the month and also sort of what the underlying health of the organisation is financially. And um, it was interesting that I, it, it was when I looked at the draft annual plan that I sort of understood where we were given that I recognise there have been a lot of ins and outs with COVID funding and so on. Um, and so I sort of wonder whether we could make that clearer in the summary. I also sort of would pick up on Sarah's point and say, if that was a big variance, it would be worth having it in that summary so that, you know, we, we sort of understand the explanation. So it's just about trying to encourage us to be able to pick out the big issues, really. Thank you. I don't think that needs an immediate response. It's it's a direction of travel and I see Jason nodding, so I think that's accepted, Claire. Um, Tony and then Paula after Tony. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, just first of all, a comment that uh, for, for those people listening in, there is a lot of work going on behind the scenes uh, regarding things like falls, ulcers, etc. And just say that I had a very uh, helpful conversation with Sam and Megana um, just a couple of weeks ago about the work that's ongoing in that to, to address the stubborn issues. Um, so I'm not I'm not going to comment on that. It, it's a couple of uh, questions. Um, first of all, we did have a conversation when we last uh, went through the IAC about radiology waiting times and um, the problems behind that, uh, staffing, access, uh, et cetera, and of course, um, whether we will need to continue the infection control issues that were brought in during COVID, which have uh, reduced um, activity by, by about 15% or so. So it's a question about radiology and, and what we'll do about that. Um, also, there's a question about cardiology weights. Um, we focus an awful lot on cancer, quite appropriately. Um, but in fact, the um, outcome and uh, morbidity and mortality associated some, with some of the cardiology problems like valve, uh, aortic valve disease, etc., have a much worse prognosis than most cancers. And I just wanted to check where we are with that. And, and finally, um, it's about antibiotics and um, the the one hour. Uh, and I realise the, the the difficulties here and how heterogeneous the data are. 
but I was just wondering um, if it's possible to stratify the severity of infection uh, and the patient's illness so we could be reassured that those who are most in need do indeed get their antibiotics in the first hour. For instance, somebody who comes in with meningitis needs their antibiotics within the first hour. And if we were reassured that those who really need it get it, I, I think that would be very helpful. Um, and it would also help, I think, clinicians to, uh, and staff to focus on, on the important part of that particular metric. Those are just the three issues I wanted to raise. Thank you, Tony. Who wants to pick those up? Andrew. Andrew thank you very much. Unfortunately, my oh. thank, thank you, Chair. Unfortunately, my connection dropped out in the middle of what you were saying, Tony, so I may have missed a middle question, but I caught your question about sepsis and time to antibiotics. Um, I, I, and we've, we've previously spoken about this, and, and I know you know I previously was the sepsis lead in the trust, so I have a little insight in, into, into how it works. Um, the, the, what we report is based on what the reporting requirements nationally have, have been, and, and that's patients who, who meet a definition uh, of, of sepsis um, based on international criteria. Um, and as you quite rightly say, there is a spectrum there. I, there. It would be possible to look at it at a subset. I guess the obvious one would be those um, who have uh, such low blood pressure that they've got septic shock, um, which is again a, a recognised subset, and and that's something I could take back, um, and that we could look at in future reports if that would be helpful to the board. Tony's nodding, Andrew. So perhaps you would take that back and discuss that with um, Megna when she comes back. Sarah, did you want to pick up Sarah Randall on some of those things? You're on mute still, Sarah. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Am I? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. I was going to pick up on the, the radiology waiting times and cardiac um, that you raised, Tony. So in terms of the radiology waiting times, there is a wider piece of work that we're doing around workforce review, um, because I think, as you see, it reflects through not only the modality waiting times, but also into cancer, that the, the particular issues that we've got are really focused on some of the hard to recruit areas and national issues that we've got, particularly with mammographers and some of the um, sonographers and radiology, uh, radiographers and radiologists. So we've, we've got that piece of work uh, that should be coming to business planning group um, shortly. Um, the infection prevention issues that you talked about is between 12 and 16 percent that we know that we've reduced in our terms of our productivity. The infection prevention team is actually working with the clinical services in uh, this week to look at how can it, it can that reduce and increase our productivity th and throughput. So that piece of work is is ongoing. I hope that answers the, that, that particular question. In terms of cardiology, particularly weights for surgery, I think you can see on the um, the waiting times, particularly in our P2s, those patients waiting for no more than um, four weeks for surgery. So absolutely, you're absolutely correct. We make, want to make sure that we are absolutely focused on making sure patients are treated in that P1 category, P1 and P2 particularly. So we have had a couple of waits over the four weeks. Um, we've had had some cancellations of patients within uh, cardiac surgery through either staff sickness, but also through um, uh, uh, the patients not being fit. So we are very close. We're monitoring that daily. I see all the cancellations coming through daily from or not from the cardiac and that has uh, actually got better. Over the last few months, last quarter, we've also been supporting Southampton from um, a regional arse through Chris Tibbs for P1 um, support because they've been um, in difficulty. So we've been giving some mutual aid. We've been one of a number of trusts giving, supporting Southampton. That's just come to an end. But we're absolutely focused on making sure patients are treated in a timely way in cardiac particularly. Thanks, Sarah. Ted, did you want to come back on any of that? No, uh, I think those are very good responses. I think it'd be very helpful just to uh, have an update as time goes by on the radiology, because uh, I appreciate the difficulties in the recruitment. Uh, uh, absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Paula. Thank you. I wonder if we could just dwell for a moment on the cancer waiting times overview. Um, 
I'm acutely conscious we've talked about this a lot in recent months and all the work that's going on to try and improve this area and also that we've got an extra green area between November and December. But by and large, this is still an overview of a sea of red. And if you look at the percentages within the red boxes, actually, by and large, they're going down still between November and December. So I just thought it would be nice if Sarah could, I'm assuming it's Sarah, could just give us a perspective on um, how she sees us progressing from here. I don't really want to gloss over this page. No, and I think, I'm sorry, Sharon, if I may come in. Thank you. Yes, um, and absolutely. And we've obviously given a lot more detail around um, our cancer information, as you can see, outlined in the in, um, IPR. So I think there are a number of issues. We always see a decline over the Christmas and New Year period uh, because of obviously holidays. And obviously, we've also had some issues around workforce and sickness. Um, what we have also seen is an increase, particularly in the two-week wait uh, um, on a number of tumour sites. So we've seen an, quite a significant increase in referrals um, and that's played out um, and that's also um, making an indent into the two-week wait process for a number of tumour sites, which we've seen. And you can see that um, on, the on I think, one of the pages there but with um, the two-week wait piece. Um, so I think that's one. The other issue we've had is that we've had the tenth theatre on the Churchill site closed. Um, we now have got that coming to be open from the uh, from April. So I think that will make a real help and indent into supporting that surgical pathway, particularly on the 31 day. One of the biggest issues is around workforce and particularly that diagnostic piece, which is really making an impact, particularly into breast. So as I said earlier on, and I won't, and I think we're looking at a piece of work coming to the board, I think at the IAC in April and then in June around more detail about these particular areas. So workforce is a big issue around radiology, which I've talked about. It's also impacting our capacity within radiotherapy, but also that's also the changes uh, um, that we're making with replacing the LINAX. We have, we have also asked for mutual aid through the Thames Valley Cancer Alliance and through to Bob ICS and Regional to support us around breast and um, radiology support. We've also spoken to Public Health England. Interestingly, we're the, there was a national shortage around particularly radiographers. So um, we, we've worked with a number of different companies trying to bring additional staff in. So um, I think those are the key themes um, Paula so but and we've got actions to address those but they're not coming to fruition and I think I've reported here before that we will see a decline in performance particularly coming into January but looking to look at the plans to bring that back up into the first quarter of next year. Jonathan if I might can I just come back on that I I that's really helpful Sarah I, I know we've talked about it a lot before um and if, as we believe, the this will pick up over the next two quarters, I think is what I hear you say, maybe one quarter from where we are physically today. Um, I wonder if we can perhaps focus on watching this progress and actually give it um, an action to target that focus of of, of the of how the how the data is coming through over the next few months so that we do actually see whether these actions that we believe and you believe will have an um, have an effect um, do take us out of um, uh, the position as it is today, as it is reported here. I know that's a bit, it's got a lag in the timing um, because it, it really does need to, we do need to feel confident, don't we, that we're going to get the, the improvement that we think these actions are going to um, produce. I think also we've also asked the Thames Valley Cancer Alliance to do some benchmarking of where we are within the Shelford Group, where we are also across the Thames Valley South, uh, sorry, um, Southeast Regional uh, Region, and although that, although that is fairly favourable across some of the standards, it doesn't feel quite right when you look at them. And um, so absolutely, I think that's why I'm, I've put some additional monitoring and to show some of the, the uh, more, so it's more easily you can see the level of detail that we're going into. Obviously, we've yeah. got further detail um but absolutely paula thank you so i think probably the right action from that is that we ask iac to pick this up and look at it more closely um so we don't want the ipr itself to get bigger and bigger at the board Great. but we want so whether this takes the form of a 
deep dive Sarah or whether it takes form of a special report. Let's let's have a chat that I'll have a chat with the chair of IAC and see whether I can persuade him that this is the right thing to, to, to do. Uh, okay. But that's the right place for this, I think, Sarah. So perhaps yeah. you and I could just catch up on how we we get to that as effectively as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see other any any other hand, so I'm going to ask a um, question of my own um, at this point. And and Terry, it, it's around the sickness absence, and it it feels from the charts, although it's not entirely easy to see it because the, 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 the we have a daily focus for the last month, and then we have a a longer term perspective on absence rates. But it feels like there's a bit of a shift going on from COVID absence into anxiety and stress uh, and longer term concerns. And I just wondered whether you could comment on how effective we think the offers that we've been making in terms of staff well-being uh, and support are. Um, I've heard sort of mixed things no, uh, in the stuff that reaches me, with some saying it's absolutely the right way of approaching it and others thinking it doesn't quite hit the, the buttons that, that address the, uh, the long-term stresses and anxieties that people have. So I think it'd be quite useful to have a sense of where you think things are, um, Terry. Yeah, thanks, Chair. So you're right, there is, but there has always been a, a stress and mental anxiety. One of the things that you would have noted from our, our, our previous business case was that actually there was a projected 30% increase in uh, as a result of COVID in relation to uh, our mental health and that type of anxiety. Um, you would have heard all of the all of the things that we've put in place in relation to R3P uh, um, and and we've also been rolling out trim as well. Now, RP3, uh, um, we've had really good feedback and, and that's something that Simon Pragnall has, has, has been leading on and, and there's been uh, good feedback about that working as teams. We're, we're now moving into a more individual piece with trim and, and trim practitioners helping people with the, uh, the mental health issues that are there. There's also been some uh, ongoing issues around how well we're managing uh, the long-term sickness absence cases around in liaison with occupational health as well. And we're doing and we've now got a new head of occupational health is who is going to be working with us closely to make sure that there's actually uh, more regular reviews and and we're monitoring and supporting our staff uh, who are long-term sick. Uh, you know, at, a, at an earlier stage rather than waiting for it to get to a half pay stage or or they're going that or staff going down to, to zero. So uh, there were a number of actions that we put together under Growing Stronger Together. Um, um, we, we think that they are working and I think that uh, when we are able to release our staff survey data, I think it will show that there's uh, that a lot of staff feel that there has uh, been good work on it. Of course, there's things that we, more things that we could do um, that will help people. There could be better use of our EAP, our Employee Assistance Program. But I, I do think we're making progress on it, but there's some more work for us to be, to, to do in relation to how effectively we're monitoring and supporting people who are off on long-term sick. And with a new occupational health lead, uh, I, I'm, I'm convinced that we'll be able to make progress on that. Thanks, Terry. Just one follow up and then Anne's um, uh, next. Um, there's a hint in the analysis of the COVID daily absence that there's over representation of BAME communities in that. And I just think as a board, we'd want to check whether we think that those things that you've just outlined we put in place help some communities more or less well than others, you know, because they they might be really effective for some groups, but not feel so accessible for others and, and we should be alert to that possibility. Yeah, um, and, and it's a point that has been noted um, in relation to uh, some of our protected characteristic groups not feeling um, that some of the psychiatric or, um, or psychological or, um, inputs uh, are right for them. Um, and, and that's why with, uh, um, with the charity we've invested in, in, in having a, a BAME Health and Wellbeing lead. 
Uh, and that Bayman Health and Wellbeing lead who's on a fixed term contract has actually started to do a lot of work about how to make sure that people get around uh, their needs, co-creating solutions uh, to some of the problems that, that we have as well. So we've invested, we've got somebody who's who started fairly recently and has also been making contact with uh, with Sam and others because um, Sam uh, chairs one of the one of our networks to make sure that we're um, tailoring our needs, tailoring our, our, our provision to the needs of, of our staff. Thanks, Terry. That's good to hear. Anne. OK, so I'm sort of following up a little bit on the same sort of theme, uh, and it's a general point, really. Um, I mean, we've got an, a, a lot of um, well-being initiatives which are all which all sound wonderful and great. But I think it's just a general plea that when we do um, set up each of these initiatives, we're very clear about how we're going to monitor um, the effectiveness of those uh, initiatives. And OK, the staff survey is one element of that, but I think I mean, we do need more than that, and I know you're aware of that anyway, but just as a sort of general point, you know, we were putting a lot of um, effort in terms of resource and money into these initiatives. So to be absolutely clear that each one of them has a clear set of um, KPIs measures so that we can see the effectiveness of those. I mean, it, it has it's a point that's come through. Actually, it'll come. You'll see later on this afternoon in the investment committee. Um, one of the recommendations for the investment committee is ensuring that when we are investing in new items, and this is more financial investment, that we are very clear um, up front about how we're going to measure the effectiveness so we can track track afterwards whether we've actually achieved our objectives. But it strikes me that it applies very much for the wellbeing initiatives, which are all very good things. And, and um, you know, I, I think it, it's really important. And I have actually just also, just for your information, I have re received from some gov uh, feedback from the governors that they would also like to see some of this too. Thank oh. you. Be very happy to provide um, our stats and KPIs on 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 our initiatives and what 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 impact it's having in what impact it's having on sickness absence rates uh, and what impact it's having uh, those specific uh, activities are having as well. So I'm very very happy to do that and and to talk to the governors on that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. That's great. Are there any other questions on the integrated performance report? Just checking, Claire, that just, just needed in the chat, is it? Yeah, thank you. Um, in which case then, we should move on to item eight, which is the draft annual plan. And I'm particularly grateful, uh, Jason, for you working this into a format that we can take it in the public session, because I think there's a lot of uh, uncertainty in people's minds about how the planning process works as we emerge from uh, a very odd couple of years into what we hope is becoming a more normal um, planning process. But at the same time, all the ground rules have changed, haven't they, since we did it previously with new organisations and, and new structures. Um, so I'm keen that it's uh, part of this process that we're, we're able to uh, have an open discussion about things that we know and also things that we don't know. And it's already been commented um, that the narrative in this makes some things we've been looked at quite often more intelligible, which is being very useful. So Jason, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Chair. So I, I won't for, talk for too long because I think a lot of the benefit uh, will probably come from, from the, the discussion. Uh, so, But firstly, apologies to all colleagues for the lateness of this paper, which was partly due to some pressures last week and partly due to, I think, the Chair's very reasonable request um, that we try to put as much as possible in public. And so I think you'll all have noted that, that where we've landed on is a narrative paper in the public domain and technical annexes in private at the moment. It, it's worth noting that the paper and the technical annexes have also been shared with the Governor's Performance Workforce and Finance Committee because we have a statutory duty to engage with governors and, and that will be uh, this evening. So the governors uh, who are uh, observing this board meeting have actually seen the same uh, technical annexes that um, uh, the board has seen. Um, the second thing to say is it is all uh, draft at this stage we are in a slightly hybrid planning year on the one hand it is more like a traditional nhs planning process than we've had the last couple of years um, for example we are actually able to plan prior to the start of the of the period nhs england has um 
provided some financial information about funding before the last day of the, of the financial year. So this is all progress. Um, on the other hand, it, it's still um, uh, an unusual context with uh, operational pressures uh, that are greater than normal. The planning timetable has been disrupted by Omicron. NHS England hoped to get everything out before Christmas. In the end, all they did was publish the very high level planning guidance and they've pushed a number of their deadlines back, which feels a little while ago now because we're probably out of the worst of Omicron, but actually there was work that would have been done in December and January uh, nationally, regionally and locally that is running a little behind probably the, the expected timetable. Hence, as I say, it, it's a bit of a hybrid year. Um, I think you'll see from the paper that, you know, we tried to highlight some of the key challenges um, uh, and opportunities. Um, we've based this very heavily on the draft submissions to the ICS. Um, so various colleagues have been on leave the last couple of weeks, but effectively the texts that our teams have submitted on particularly activity and workforce are the basis of the information uh, that you have here. You can see, and, and, and uh, I'm sure will be questions for all of us, but particularly for Sarah on this point, you can see that we believe we can put a plan in to meet the, the, the uh, uh, national uh, target to deliver 104% of pre-COVID activity. And you can see that we currently believe we'll make some, we'll sustain the good progress we've made this year on 104 week waits and make the required progress on 78 week waits. Um, you can see where we think we'll get to on cancer. Um, there are um, pluses and minuses of uh, planning at an ICS level, which the paper tries to explain. There's, there are definitely benefits, but there are also complexities associated with the time scales not being any longer, but there being an additional ICS step um, involved. Um, I think in, in finalising the paper, what I was really struck on uh, is in addition to sort of, you know, obviously any sort of technical questions or items of discussion that the board want to pose, but the balance of um, risk and ambition uh, in the plan. So on the one hand, um, uh, there's clearly uh, an element of risk associated with uh, the elective recovery targets, and I think they're they're politically very high profile. So there'll be there'll be scrutiny on a scrutiny on us if we. Uh, Set, an, set a target and miss it, and there'll be scrutiny on us if we uh, set a target which is deemed not to be ambitious enough. And clearly there are risks on, on, on the money. On the other hand, having looked at the IPR and discussed it as we've just done, and also obviously you'll see both in the IPR and in private board view on the surplus, we need to bear in mind, of course, that um, the, our experience of the last two years has been thinking that the finances would be worse than they turned out to be. Um, but we've been, we've been very successful this year, which is all, all credit to our clinical teams and, and Sarah's leadership in um, actually uh, getting the 52 week waits not eliminated, but down substantially from where we were a year ago from getting very close to eliminating the 104 week waits. I mean, there's again, we can touch on exactly where we are on that. Um, so that's, you know, and actually keeping the waiting list fairly stable. And if we look back to where we were a year ago, we all we all thought there was quite a lot of risk in what we were trying to achieve in the current year on that and actually we've largely delivered what we set out to do um and on the workforce we're all acutely aware of uh you know the pressures our teams are under and whether of vacancies but it's worth remembering and the paper doesn't really hide out of this too much that we have a, a larger workforce than we had two years ago and actually our international recruitment pipeline is opening up again so we're actually fairly well placed to address some of the workforce challenges so one of the things we'll need to do as we finalise the plan into April um, is make sure we've got the balance of, of risk and ambition uh, right. And then the final piece just to join up adopts is, and apologies for more the exec team that it's a bit belated, the, the paper references at a very high level a proposed structure for objectives. And uh, I think uh, the non-executives have now seen at least some draft on how that might be fleshed out in detail. And I think you've got an opportunity to discuss that draft later today. What we're hoping by the point we reach final plan is that some version of the detail of those objectives can be annexed to the private plan. So that sort of comes together with uh, the, the, uh, a final agreed set of metrics that we're tracking as objectives, um, which supports the overarching, uh, overarching objectives and then the detail of the plan. So there are a few moving parts that with the, with the board having visibility of a wider set of papers, you can see how they are intended to come together uh, uh, in April. And at that point, Chair, I will uh, stop, as I say, because I, I, I think we'll all benefit from discussion rather than me summarising the paper further.
Thank you very much, Jason. And Anne's already uh, indicated she'd like to start that. Anne. OK, so thank you, Jason. I think this was a very um, helpful um, paper and summarise as well sort of where we're, where we're at. And obviously you acknowledging that this is work in progress. I think the, the one thing that I just wanted to just pause, which I paused on when I read, um, so it was paragraph 7.12. Um, so I said, you know, the draft plan is broadly break even after these assumptions with the underlying deficit of 47 million um, covered by non recurrent funding. So I just wanted to pause on that. So I had to read that a few times to make sure I understood that what that meant. Um, and, and I know that you have said elsewhere that the underlying deficit um, has remained more or less stable year on year. So that just brought me back to sort of our longer term ambitions and where we are in terms of, you know, how we hope to move forward to get away from this level of underlying deficit, which was, um, you know, has been our intention to eliminate that. I know you do highlight that there's no money for investment, but I just want I just felt it would be worth just exploring that statement a little bit as to how you think that's going to play out. Off you go, Jason. John. OK, thank you. So actually something I hope was obvious to colleagues, but I realised I didn't spell it out was the the ordering of the paragraphs in section seven. Uh, follows the labels in the bridge analysis in the private annex. So if you have um, mm. that in hand, you can yeah. see there's a bridge from our uh, yeah. current forecast uh, position for this year through to that, and, and each paragraph describes elements in the bridge. I think I think there's a couple of judgments um, that make, you know, uh, estimating the underlying position um, an estimate, and I've actually gone for the probably more cautious way of doing it. So the two big um, non-recurrent benefits that are flagged in that analysis are the fact that we're currently underspending our COVID income, which we've touched on uh, in the last two or three board or IAC discussions of um, the IPR, and also the fact that we either are underspending our recovery funds or possibly not fully allocating them to costs. Um, and that I'm, I'm sure that the right thing to do is to regard the underspend on COVID budgets as non-recurrent. It will probably take at least another year to unwind. As you can see, we're going to get some further significant COVID funding in the current financial year. The recovery budget I've I, I've chosen to present as non-recurrent. Um, there is another way of looking at it, which is that we didn't have any elective care growth money uh, in 2021 or 21-22. And that um, effectively we're being offered all of that recovery money and possibly a bit more uh, into 22-23. Um, and it may well turn out to be the case that by, we get, by the time we get into 23-24, that that level of recovery money is, is, is almost baked into the baseline. Uh, into, so um, I, I've i mm. gone for the more cautious of the two ways of presenting it, but it's, it's, it is a bit of a judgment as to whether actually that recovery money is recurrent. We've certainly got a government which has committed three or four years worth of significant recovery income. So that non-recurrent income isn't going to disappear that quickly. And uh, we should be able, we should be planning for, you know, a sort of multi-year soft landing whereby the underlying trend of growth catches up with the recovery money and we don't actually, and it smooths. But, but certainly we've got two or three years more of that level of not of, of non-recurrent income to look forward to. So could I just come back on that very quickly just to say that I think it would be really helpful is is one of our sort of future sessions, maybe not in the formal board meetings, but offline as we um, have a sort of a, a, a more in-depth review of where we are in terms of, you know, the how we see the underlying deficit or hopefully underlying break-even position um, emerging over the sort of initiatives that we're going to invest in or not over the next few years. So I would appreciate us having a, a more in-depth discussion on that to understand where where we are in that journey. Thanks, Anne. Jason, I think that's entirely consistent with what you'd like to see us discuss as well. So we'll we'll work out the best mechanism for doing that. And I think, Anne, you're right. It's probably not formal business. It's probably a chance to work at it um, and uh, 
look at some ways of describing you know what what's best described as underlying deficit what what's really about the assumptions we're making about non-recurrent funds being available every year but in slightly different ways and then that's about degrees of risk that we might be prepared to take or not or not yep. take um so uh, i think it would be good to create an environment for us to do that where we can explore rather than are just being asked to support or not support um assumptions there and jason i'm pretty sure that's very consistent with what you'd like to see us doing as a board as well from conversations that we've had yeah, so we'll, you know, I'll just talk offline to a number of colleagues about the best time to do that. Some point uh, in the next two or three months, maybe best after we've done the accounts and almost have a firm view on um, uh, the final position for 21-22, but that can all be debated. Great, thank you. Uh, so I have in the queue now Tony to be followed by Ash and then Sarah Horden. So Tony. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, just a couple of minor points, really. Uh, paragraph four. Um, optics. Uh, I just wonder whether it's better to put patients above our people, um, seeing as our patients are our main focus, uh, although of course we need to get the people right, but I do think maybe we just sort of switch that for the optics. Um, there's an increase of 184 FTEs in the plan, and um, I think it'd be helpful to have a breakdown of that, um, clinical, non-clinical, uh, etc and um, you know maybe where they're being placed just so people can understand where our investments are going from the business case and finally flat cash from the ICS so I was just wondering how how does that deal with over performance Jason particularly that last one I think Look. Thank you, Chair. So I've answered Tony's first two questions because they're, they're they're quite factual uh, in the chat. Um, so there is a quasi payment by results uh, uh, regime that's going to be in place next year, in which if we plan for 104 percent of activity, we get a basic allocation plus we get an initial um, elective recovery allocation, and that's all assumed in the plan at the moment. Um, it looks like there is going to be a payment of 75% of tariff values for work we do in house and 100% of tariff values for work that we subcontract in the independent sector for performance above 104%. Um, and so, working with Sarah and Lisa and that team, they have sort of a license to go and look for as many opportunities to outperform the 104% baseline as they can find and as are broadly affordable with that envelope. I have said to Sarah that if we have a small number of sort of super high cost cases that cost more than 75 percent or 100 percent, we should probably still plan on doing them anyway uh, and we'll work out how to make that up somewhere else. So I'm particularly thinking about the uh, some of the uh, high value craniofacial cases, some really tricky cases that that may well cost more than 75 percent. It will be a handful of them, but they're they're long waiters and they're complex cases. Um, at the moment, I'm not assuming an upside on that and Sarah is sort of gearing up to work out whether she feels by April that she'd recommend that we try to plan for more than 104 percent but it is flat cash plus that payment regime if we outperform 104 percent Tony. Tony do you want to come back on that? No that sounds uh, very helpful thank you very much. Thank you Ash. Um, sorry, first one's a bit, I, I think is a typo. In 6.5, you've got to uh, talk about sickness at 4% and uh, reduction to 3.8, but only put 0.02% reduction. So I think that's, that is just a typo, but it just needs correcting. Um, my other is that you took in the risks and mitigations, etc. you talked about, there isn't anything regarding uh, pay inflation. Um, and I'm slightly concerned given the, ra the rate at which inflation is rising at the moment. And I know you've made assumptions based on HSE numbers, but there are some significant risks, I suspect, where there may be greater pressure on that than we are anticipating this moment. And I'm not quite sure how and where that sits within this. I forgot to come back, Chair. So on, on pay inflation, um, I, I think we have limited risk. So 
uh, there's going to be a national pay deal and generally the translation of the national pay deal into funding for OUH works fairly well as it were. Our workforce is sufficiently aligned to the shape of the national workforce that when a pay deal is cascaded as extra funding we don't tend to lose out. Um, I think there's probably two risks. One which I think is a sort of quasi-inflationary risk is that um, uh, our staff are going to face or everyone in the country is going to face significant cost of living pressures in the coming years. And we might discuss some of that in private board. And that can lead to a kind of quasi -infl pay inflation around things like a grade inflation. So um, the sort of the, there's a pressure to up band posts, but it's not really pay inflation simple. Um, but pay inflation, as it were, will get funded for whatever the pay deal is. We've made an assumption based on a national deal. If the government decides to pay more than its current assumption, we will get funded for that. Um, however, um, the, the, there is a risk around non-pay inflation, uh, which we're working through at the moment. We're tr so as the paper says, we're, we're doing analysis to try to work out the extent to which our fixed price contracts for large amounts of the non-pay cost base um, cover the fact that for the non-fixed price um, uh, contracts, there may there'll be paying, there'll be non-pay inflation above NHS England's assumption. And so that's noted. As, I can't quite quantify it at the moment in a way I'm happy with. So I've just, uh, but I don't think there's a pay inflation risk. So can I just, uh, just in terms of that, I just re realised the non-pay. So do you have any any idea? And I, uh, this is a really difficult play, question to ask almost. What the energy cost implications are going to be for the organisation over the course of the next year, given the fact that there are some huge <laughs> increases pr proposed in that. So this is probably something slightly before your time. So in um, the it autumn of so 2020, we fixed our energy prices for two years at a low point in the market. So we are 100% protected against energy prices for the next 12 months. So we're very grateful to Jason for securing that. Um, thank you, Sarah Horden. Thank you. Um, I, I've got a few. Um, the 104% of 1920 target was 1920 the year that we had the theater, West Wing theatres shut and therefore is there, if we're being honest with ourselves, is there actually a benchmark which if we had West Wing theatres fully running at, we would be able to say you know, to deliver the same as an, an equalised 1920 would give us what proportion? Sorry, I don't think I've put that terribly clearly, Sarah, but I think you get what I'm driving at. She nodded at the question, so I'm sure that she's Sarah. So 1920, we had the the West. Um, it was the JR. I think it was the JR theatres that night, in, and then it, the following year was the West Wing. So um, the, we we know that we would probably like our numbers are low that year, and so everybody knows that. So we would be able to increase. We are have increased and gets up to. I think it was 104 percent. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, so we're, we're looking at what we can do to increase increase those those against that. So I think I think when we see the final plan, it would be really interesting to see 1920 activity, yeah. then a kind of normalised 1920, and then where we think we're going to come out, just so we understand how much we're pushing ourselves versus how much we've got a little bit of kind of fat in the system. So we're certainly working on the 1920 where we were, where we planned an actual. Um, I, I, we, can, we, we can look at what that other piece is about where if it, we had all the theatres running. Yes, I can. We, we can see that. Look at that. So, Sarah, just to tease out in issues, I think that I think are in that question, and just check that I've understood them right. I mean, I think there are two different things that we're asking here. One is in the financial plan, what will the performance we expect to deliver look like? to the people running the electric recovery fund you know we, and that may be quite generous to us if we have an artificially low um, base because of having theatres closed and then there's a second question which is our productivity question are we doing as well as we want to do in terms of increasing productivity where what we want is a baseline that is what, what would it have been in 1920 if everything had been open uh, and that enables us to measure whether we're increasing the productivity. And, and I think both Jason and Sarah completely get those two points, but we need to keep them separately because they, they have different implications for our understanding of, of what's there. Sarah, have I un understood what's behind the question correctly? Yes, enough? you've articulated it much better than I did. Thank you. Um, Next question from you, Sarah. OK, so um, 
in terms of the workforce numbers that we've got in here, um, just so I'm clear, we've got quite a lot of vacancy built in at the moment in terms of we, we see those by division where we've got people off. In terms of the budget, are we just taking the current actual workforce and then building off that? Or are we assuming that we will fill some of that vacancy as part of this as part of this plan? Terry, I just need to check because I should say Terry was on leave while uh, Rachel um, finalised some of the workforce numbers. So I can answer the question if 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 Terry doesn't know the answer because Rachel uh, did all this in his absence. Yes, Terry, do you want to answer? answer it? That feels rough on Terry. Um, answer the question and then Terry can. No, that's anything. fair enough. So, so that's quite right. So we are we are not assuming effectively a sort of a net unwinding of the level of vacancy. And um, it's worth noting, by the way, we have 10 percent more staff than we had two years ago. So we just need to work to, need to understand when we quote a vacancy number that it's partly due to us creating additional posts. And actually, if you look at the, the total whole time equivalents working in the trust, we're 10 percent up. So it's really hard to tell with COVID and with the with the infection prevention and control whether you know that me represents a, an increase in the staff actually available to deliver care or not because sickness is higher than it was, etc. But um, but you need to you need to have the vacancy number in your mind planted alongside the net increase of staff as well. But one of the things I was going to pick up with you offline was it would be really interesting to see the whole time equivalents, including bank and agency. Um, so because we've got a decrease in bank and agency, I think we've we've done well at what we were trying to do, which is reducing bank and agency and increasing actual employed whole time equivalents. So I think but I think therefore, to be fair to everybody, we should be looking at the net increase in whole time equivalents, not just the increase in employed. So could I make two observations? Uh, one is to pick up what Katie's pointed out in the, in the chat, um, which is just knowing what our assumptions are in terms of the people into money bits uh, and student vacancy rates is it's just a bit of making sure we're on the same page as we read these the, these numbers. The, the second is that it feels to me, Sarah, so this this might be worth a bit of work as we discussed in relation to the underlying deficit question and uh, of of. Mm -hmm taking a bit of time on um, Terry to just have a look at the workforce plan, not at the headline level, but understanding what sits behind it in, in terms of where the staff are and um, what the implications of shifting from the bank and agency into the, um, uh, the, the our own staff. But there's also things about us understanding what is the impact of opening more critical care beds, opening the trauma um, beds? Because that means that comparison year on year is not really a like like for like. And just understanding how those patterns look, that, that requires a bit of digging in, I think, that we wouldn't do every time and we wouldn't do for the plan, but we should do at some point in the next few months. Sarah, would that be a sensible way of taking those questions forward? I think it would. I think it ties back to actually the, another point I wanted to raise, which was it be interesting. To, we're on a journey under the finance governance review. I know because of the time constraints, we haven't necessarily done this, but I think our ultimate ambition was very much to have a work for you know a both Jason's sort of top down approach on taking where we are to date and looking at what we've agreed and signed offers to build in, but also that bottom up approach of actually what is the workforce plan, what does that workforce plan cost. Yeah, and that would answer Katie's question, I think, around are we financing a full plan with an assumption about percentage vacancy or are we just kind of carrying what we've always got? So I think that I totally accept where Jason's coming from, but I think that piece about where where and how are we on that journey in the in the finance governance review from the bottom up would be helpful to understand as part of that conversation. So I think from that, Terry and Jason, perhaps you could have a think and brief me on when and how we might be able to dig into that workforce um, plan and, and bring the numbers and the people plan together. Um, uh, I think that would be helpful and it feels like it's quite similar to the underlying deficit issue that um, Anne picked up, that it's worth a bit of time at one point in the cycle, just making sure we have a common understanding of those things. So we'll take that. Where's the action, Sarah? Okay, I, I've got a couple Next more. Question. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we, you touched very briefly, but it'd be good to hear from Jason what this plan is assuming around the critical care building 
how much of that building is actually going to be up and operational and how much of it is that we're still waiting for a revenue business case to, to open those additional beds. And alongside that, um, to understand what we've done, where we've got these new facilities, what we've done around increasing maintenance budgets to go alongside those. So even though we've got a fixed price for the gas, for example, our consumption will clearly go up where we've got new facilities, but equally we'll have portering costs and, and general maintenance costs and making sure that we're actually building those allowances in. So that that's the last one on that sort of revenue side, understanding exactly what we're doing about critical care. And then I don't know, Jonathan, whether you want to pick up the capital questions in the private board where I think there's there's a more meaty piece around where the capital allocation is sitting. I think that probably is a private board issue because we've, it has implications for uh, suppliers and the like. So let's hold those for the private boards. Jason, do you want to, to pick up the critical care assumptions and the like? Yeah, so the critical care oh. assumptions are in paragraph 5.9 where the bed numbers are described and effectively what this plan proposes is that we uh, when we go into the building, we open with 18 beds, which is an increase on the current bed numbers, and it rises to 24. That won't be using the full building. Um, we, we also have a need to um, uh, do some life cycling work on the neuro ICU building. And so we're, we, we, I think the proposal that Sam, might, Sam or Sarah might come in here is that we make a slight tactical um, uh, decision this uh, year that since we don't have the budget to open all that capacity yet and we also have a requirement to decant neuro ICU for a period of the year to an, to an appropriate clinical facility that we move neuro ICU into, in you for a number of months um, which will save us and our PFI partners quite a lot of operational disruption or minimise the operational disruption. What we don't yet have a clear plan for and it partly depends on assumptions about the future of elective recovery is we should be able to develop a plan to bring the building fully into use in a meaningful time frame as um, the elective volumes ramp up, particularly on the complex cases. But you can see the bed numbers for this year. But but say the the reason that we only stop at 24 is partly money, but partly we have a another another problem that the empty space in the building helps us solve uh, in the short term. Sarah, you put your uh, Randy, you put your hand up and down again. Do you, is that because Jason said what you were going to say or do you want to add? Just that we are, are looking to um, move neuro ICU in, into uh, into the building so that we can have time to refurbish that area, and that's the reason why I didn't want to leave it just open um, at that point. So it'll just be for a, an, a few months. Thanks, Sarah. Jason did offer Sam you the chance to come in. Did you want to or not? Just nothing, nothing to add. Um, the the neuro ITU is. Um, the flooring needs replacing. We're also going to undertake some ventilation work, so it's quite important that we do this piece of work. Thank you. Uh, Paula, over to you. Thank you. Um, Sarah asked a couple of my questions, actually, so I'll just um, make one observation, really, which extends the point I made on cancer waiting times when we were talking about the integrated performance report earlier. I was very conscious when I was reading this report, which was really helpful, as we look at the waiting list comments, for example, for example in 5.4, we're able to articulate our hope for waiting lists and where we're trying to go. As soon as we get into cancer, we're articulating um, actions that by and large, not exclusively, but by and large actions that we hope to take, but not yet able to translate that into how we hope waiting times um, the, the cancer standards will change. So I think it just reinforces that action that we took earlier for IAC. And I don't know whether by the time we finalise this plan, we'll be able to say anything more about where we think um, the cancer standards might be as a result of these actions. I realise it's a really difficult area, but I'd like to just keep the focus on it. Thank you. Sarah's nodding, so I think we'll take that as accepted by the board unless anybody speaks against and we'll start by wrapping that up into the IAC. Perfect. Uh, but it may be that there's further stuff from that that we need to pick up as well, I think. OK, I have no other hands raised at present, so I think that means that we should move on from the public discussion of the draft uh, annual plan. Uh, and then that takes us to item nine, which is the proposed quality priorities 
which Andrew gets to present, but um, I'm sure everyone will remember a substantial amount of work and discussion already gone into um, this. Uh, it's been through the Trust Management Executive, it's been through the Integrated Assurance Committee, uh, and uh, the Governor's PMQ Committee has also had an opportunity to comment uh, and feedback. Um, and uh, perhaps if I go to uh, Andrew um, and then Sally Jane may, may want to comment anything from the Governor's. Um, uh, you're not obliged to Sally Jane, but but you may do as, as, as you're with us. So Andrew. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the paper. I won't go through it because I, I know you'll have read it. It's worth just briefly mentioning, uh, as you alluded to, um, Sir Jonathan, that the, the process is slightly different this year. We would normally, as part of the process of putting together our quality priorities, have a quality conversation event, which we had planned for January, but which after um, consultation, um, the executive colleagues um, decided not to go ahead with because of all the pressures um, from Omicron at the time. So instead, it's been through a, um, a, a process of internal um, consultation initially to, to come up with, uh, prioritise and develop the priorities. Um, and then I'm really grateful for the scrutiny and feedback of the Patient Experience Membership and Quality Committee. Um, I had a very constructive meeting with Sally Jane, who fed back some of those things um, and comments which have been incorporated into the final paper, which is before the board today. So the paper includes the proposals for the coming year's quality priorities, but it also includes some updates on previous year's quality priorities. And I'm happy to take any comments. And Sam, you may want to add to that because I know you've had an important role too. So you do, Sam. Hands gone up. So Sam. Thank you. I just wanted to illustrate an example of um, the importance of our governing body supporting and reviewing this. And thank you to Sally Jane. So one of the examples of that is focused around the reduction of violence and aggression. Um, and whilst implicit, Andrew and I discussed after governing um, governors have met, um, it was really important to point out the impact that, that uh, violence and aggress aggressive um, incidents have on patients that are also in the in the bays or in the ward areas and, and that's just one example of the input so i'd like to thank sally jane and the patient experience uh, committee from the governors uh, for that one example but many examples of their support for this i would echo that i think it's a better paper as a result so thank you thanks very much sally jane did you want to feed in any observations that came through from the governors well, I was just going to say very briefly that thank you that what we said was listened to and has been acted on, and um, we're very pleased about that. And we'll be looking forward to monitoring how these um, pan out during the next year. Thank you, Sarah Jane. Thank you, and we know that you will. Uh, Tony. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so a point for the future, next year, perhaps. Um, because when I look at um, the appendix and how we will evaluate success, um, that's all, of course, about process of, of what we are going to do. It doesn't actually say how will we note whether we achieve success or not. So we haven't got specifics and metrics of what we're aiming for, a 10% reduction in this or you know, uh, that that sort of thing. So I wonder if in the future we could perhaps give that some thought, um, because I think it's really good to measure ourselves against specific metrics and estimates, as opposed to what I think are predominantly processes. If I may respond to that, Tony, thank you. I think that's a I think that's a that's a very good point. Um, certainly quite a bit of work and engagement with with the leads in the quality priorities went into trying to prepare this and and some have 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 better defined measurable metrics than others others are really about developing new systems or, or uh, and and perhaps a, don't a slightly more difficult to formulate those but i do take the point about measures of success and i and, and absolutely that we that's something we can work to strengthen going forwards Thank you, Andrew. Sarah Horden. So Tony's asked my question about about metrics, um, but I would definitely support that. Um, just having some some real targets that you can test against. But the other one was just from this year's um, quality priorities. 
the psychological medicine ones, which are only partially achieved in the report. And I was just, but I don't think it's being taken forward into next year's quality priorities. And I just wondered how we were going to catch that because it sounds like you know, some very sensible pieces of work that just aren't quite getting there for some fairly simple reasons around things like technology or availability of space. So it's how are we going to make sure we don't lose the progress that we've made and can we can we finish off psychological medicine? Yes, thank you, Sarah. And, and it's important to, to point out that's not the only one that, of course, that wasn't brought forward to this year. And, and, and many of the work streams that were part of the previous year's quality priorities have really been embedded into business as usual. Um, the, um, the, the specifics in psychological medicine I've not been personally involved in, so I might have to defer to colleagues or to Megan when she returns in, in, in terms of the detail of those. But... Um, but but certainly the the aims haven't gone away, and um, I'd be happy to follow up to try and uh, establish what the outlook and milestones are going forwards. Thanks, Andrew. Perhaps you discuss that with Megan when she comes back, and if there's a straightforward answer, she can drop an email around, and if not, it can be fed into the process. Um, Katie. So mine is also slightly to do with what's not in this paper. So um, can you briefly comment if there's anything that didn't make it into the final nine that's causing anxiety that we, 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 we're not going to focus on as part of this um, activity, but there's also things that are bubbling under. Do you know what I mean? Things that didn't get into the top nine, but are there anxieties about other things that we should be aware of? Um, thank you, Katie. I, so amongst the things that we obviously considered were all of the quality priorities from the previous year and where and, 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 and whether whether it was going to bring greater track, whether the traction of, of having a quality priority was going to, you know, um, aid the, those those programs uh, or 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 aid the ones we've included more. Um, and these were prioritized for the reason that we thought it would bring the most traction. Um, there's one example of an area which we did think about as a new quality priority, but which is not included, um, was around um, streamlining uh, multidisciplinary team meetings, uh, particularly in cancer specialties, but also in other specialties. But that is something that has been incorporated into um, other objectives, um, which I think the board will be looking at this afternoon. So, so um, that's the one that comes to mind, which I think we've got a, a firm plan to keep um, on the agenda. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Claire. Thank you, Jonathan. It's really a sort of general observation. We've had a lot of discussion about sort of metrics today. Um, and also setting ourselves milestones and targets and then reflecting back on our performance against them. And, and it isn't easy, is it? Otherwise, we'd sort of be doing that much more. And I think that, you know, estimating the impact of our actions in a really complex system is hard. And so I sort of have some questions about whether we can get more benchmarking from other organisations that would help us. Um, also, whether there's good practice. I mean, Tony, you raised the question regarding the quality metrics. You know, have you seen good practice elsewhere that we could have a look at? And I think it's really important that we go through that iterative process because we actually learn much more about how sort of that particular actions then have an effect on um, progress. And we're able to estimate better um, you know how how that helps us to meet the targets. So it's bit, a bit of a plea to have a think about this area generally, and have a particular think about benchmarks and um, and good practice elsewhere. Perhaps if I can briefly respond and then bring Sam in. Um, the um, we were very grateful to feedback um, we received during this process about both of those issues, and 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 some work did go in. It's not it's not easy to get good benchmarking data in a number of these areas, but it, the, the, the desire to get benchmarking data and to use that is incorporated into some of the plans and Sam might speak more to that. Um, so I think the point is really well taken and this is and clearly um, some of these are a work in progress as part of the as individual quality priorities and some of it is about how we mature this as we go forwards. Sam, you can pick up that invitation and you were next anyway, so you can then move on to whatever it was you wanted to say. 
Thank you. I just wanted to pick back up on Katie's point and, and maybe touch back on the benchmarking. So actually it's it's um the the process is giving us a framework by which we can sort of extend. So if I look at it's not so much not included because work will continue. Um, and actually, if I use sort of hospital acquired pressure ulcers, we're going to adopt the same format and um, rigor for reduction of falls, reduction of hospital acquired thrombosis and improvement in nutrition. So I was flipping it on its head. This is a nice sort of core process of which we can follow. So through harm care, um, harm free care, Megan and I have got a joint objective around um, a harm free um, suite of objectives that will follow um, this format. In terms of benchmarking, I think there are bigger opportunities to look internally as well. Um, we are speaking at Shelford next week about the opportunities around tissue viability, but we just keep coming back to how people, you know, do and don't measure things differently. There are some standard things that we return, um, but actually through the Oscar process and some of the other um, audits, we're seeing some variance in practice and opportunities where there is excellence to learn and through things like the QI stand up um, that a number of us attended yesterday, they're really good um, sort of opportunities where a large group of staff can dial in and hear about an individual um, ward or department that's undertaken some QI and is spreading the word and that's a real focus um, under Sarah's leadership for the, the quality improvement team. Um, over the coming year to ensure that we're sharing good practice internally, um, but still striving for that those external benchmarks where we can. Thanks, Sam. And as we've often discussed, it's not always straightforward knowing who the most useful people to benchmark against either. You know, are, are they people whose operations generally look quite like us or are they people who've done particularly well in a particular area and therefore we're wanting to, to learn from them so uh, intelligent event marking is quite important um, and similarly understanding the complexity of the links between the metrics and the actions so that we don't automatically assume that because the metrics look good that that's because of the actions or even that you no know, because the metrics haven't moved that that is because the actions are the wrong actions it may be they just need longer to operate or it may be there are fluctuations so we need all these things and then we need to use it intelligently uh, and um, I'm confident that we're moving in the right direction on that. It feels as though we've we've able to have much better conversations each time we go around this this loop which is important. Okay um, so I think then um, we do approve those quality priorities, which is not the surprise given that they've we've been party to the process going through, but that's been a very helpful discussion in terms of um, what lies behind it and how we want to use it going forward. Um, we're in we're one minute ahead of what my timetable tells me should be the time for a break. Um, I was hoping we'd be more, um, uh, but we'll pick up the agenda again at five past 11 to give people a chance to come for a break. Um, caffeine infusions, whatever it is that they do in that. Um, so uh, I will call things back to order at five past 11, but simply go off camera and go on mute um, so that I don't lose you in the meeting. See you again then. <laughs>